Thank you very much for coming, and he's uh, very sorry for the delay, but there was a mudslide near his house, and then a lot of traffic. And I'll say a couple of words about him. Uh, I met him around in the 80s, so a very long time ago. Most of you were not even born. And uh, already at that time, he was talking to me about cha communication channels between the brain and the rest of the body, and peptides, and things like that. So he was doing basically was thinking in terms of systems biology, even before the, the term was coined. And he has written uh, recently a book about the uh, connection between the brain and the microbiome, which is it's a very interesting book. And if you read it, you will see an interesting stories that uh, he could have stayed in the Bavarian Alps and, and, and take uh, the, the family business, a very lucrative business selling chocolate and pastries, etc. But he had a gut feeling that he had to do something different <laughs> in the US. And so you are very fortunate today to have uh, Edward Meyer. communication between brain gut and microbiome. It's something um, I've been studying the, the communication between the brain and the gut for most of my career. Um, at the time of my thesis, it was actually the cardiovascular system in the brain. <clears throat> it was interesting, but um, I found the clinical applications of these um, brain-body interactions more interesting in, in gastroenterology at the time, so I, I switched to that. And, uh, um, and so nobody was really interested in this topic for the last, um, I would say for the better part of my career, it was kind of a fringe area. Uh, gastroenterologists would say the brain doesn't really play any role in gastrointestinal disease, um, and psychiatry was not interested in the gut either. So it was, the things changed um, instantaneously and sort of unexpectedly with the appearance of the microbiome as the main uh, area of research interest, and that has sort of started a very unexpected uh, fascination, not just of scientists, but you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the public media, uh, which in my opinion has really greatly exaggerated and extrapolated the um, implications that we currently have uh, approved for. So let me, this brief introduction, let me just... Okay, so brief disclosure. This has been interesting for me, also the interest, the interest of not only startup companies, but also the, the big food companies who all of a sudden have realized that the, the gut microbiome um, plays an important role in not just overall health, but brain health. And uh, even though um, in my book as a sort of um, presented the, 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 the food industry as sort of the, the enemies of our health. That's really they, these guys have realized that uh, they have something to contribute to this and are willing to really make dramatic uh, changes. 
So uh, let me go over the, 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 the three areas that I want to touch on. The first one is kind of a general int introduction. And I don't know how much this audience knows about this, so you know, I'll try to go through this fairly briefly. Um, then mention briefly three areas, uh, depending on if you have time. Uh, I, I just stick with the, the uh, 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 IBS and with depression and, and touch briefly on obesity. And then say some, some of my personal opinions about how, where we currently stand with this in terms of um, human disease. Um, as a gastroenterologist um, and still a practicing gastroenterologist, I'm obviously interested in the practical applications or implications um, in terms of treatment and, and, and diagnostics. Um, and I know that the animal side, the animal research has uh, leapfrogged way ahead of what we know about humans. Um, I mean, ultimately, there's some, some areas I think we'll be beginning to understand how this communication works and what, which implication it has. So I can start this talk without mentioning an article that um, 1991, uh, this is when I uh, first met Pierre, um, and I actually approached him because I was interested in this topic of, um, of biological communication uh, between cells, kind of anticipatory, I think, what happened then 30 years later, <laughs> giving a talk to you today. Um, it, but, but it's always fascinated me how cells use uh, at the time, it was the uh, neuropeptides and blood peptides that were called. But in the meantime, obviously, that has expanded dramatically. And um, at the time, we sort of tried to squeeze this into um, if information theory could um, could explain some of the communication patterns that uh, that, that cells use to, to talk to each other. So, in the meantime. Um, Communication between different organs, and particularly between the microbes and the brain, has sort of become my main area of interest. And so, it's good to ask yourself: Why would there be any? I mean, why would the microbes even uh, want or be able to talk to our, our brain? Um, and if you look at um, look at evolution, so microbes have been the dominant life form in the oceans for more than three billion years. Um, and about 500 million years, uh, supposedly there was the first colonization of primitive marine animals like the hydra, um, which were basically floating digestive tracts um, that have a nerve net around them, which would regulate something very similar to what peristalsis is in, in the now in the, in the, in the mammalian uh, GI tract. Um, and, and these early microbes start to communicate with these with these nerve nets, um, produce. Um, chemicals, mediators that would stimulate or, or modify the, the, this peristaltic activity. Uh, so this was used by, these, uh, by the hydra to both ingest, digest, and expel uh, nutrients that they collected in the, from, from the ocean. Um, so what did the microbes do during these 3.5 billion years when they're floating around the ocean? They, they obviously perfected the communication system that they used to talk to each other and create communities, ecological communities um, and with that amazing amount of genetic uh, information stored in them they were able to transfer some of this to the nervous system or to the precursors of enteroendocrine cells in the uh, inside this, this digestive tube of the, uh, of the hydro. So it's really the first brain when you look at this, um, I know some of you may have heard about the best-selling book by Mike Gershon, The Second Brain, The Interior Nervous System. But it's really the first brain, um, because only later, when animals became polar, uh, they developed a central nervous system that would then take some of the information and communication signals from, from the first brain, the microbes' first brain, into the second brain. So we have a, a shared code for this communication that started with the microbes. Um, they had a long time to develop this. Um, and the reason that they can communicate with us and have a very intimate um, interaction with our enteric nervous system and our central nervous system is the fact that from the beginning in evolution they were very close together, more than the heart and any other um, parts of, of, of our bodies. So you all notice I borrowed this slide from, um, from, from Rob Knight. Um, 
just to illustrate how, um, um, how, how vast this information is that these microbes have gathered uh, and developed, primarily through communication and, uh, and, uh, and metabolism. We obviously don't know most of what most of these genes do. We, we talk about functions we often focus on, for example, short-chain fatty acids, one tiny piece of that, um, that information that, that, that the microbes carry with them. On the left side, um, you can see that the, um, the main functions of, of, of microbes, and probably that's what they initially did in the GI tract of the, of the hydra, was metabolism of substances um, that, that the animal could not produce uh, or, or uh, digest. Um, and in the meantime, we know there's quite a few of these functions. So you could say the, 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 the primary function of the microbes when they start to interact with, with the mammalian host, uh, with the uh, animal host, was, um, was related to, to metabolism. Um, but on the right side, you see that these metabolites were not just byproducts from from digesting fiber or complex carbohydrates, but they also function as signaling molecules um, to virtually every other part of the body, um, well characterized. Um, so both the metabolites and neuroactive substances that the microbes produce. Um, and being able to communicate both with the enteric nervous system, their original closest neighbor, uh, but also now there's extensive evidence for, for the cardiovascular system immune system um, and um, with, uh, with the brain. The data from the brain comes, and I'll come back to this thing, primarily from, from studies in experimental animals, rodents uh, primarily, and even though we know, for example, the cardiovascular effects of microbial metabolites um, have been well documented also in humans, in terms of the, um, the, the, the brain effects and the uh, consequences of communication of the brain are uh, less well known or less well demonstrated in humans. Just to give you a couple of examples of this kind of um, communication, where we know, um, you know the basic design, and this this is kind of a reductionistic model, obviously, so that microbes in the gut lumen can communicate with specialized uh, cells in in the gut wall. Uh, in this case, we're showing this for the entrochromophilic cells, main site for the storage of, um, uh, of, of serotonin. And these cells have these extensions, the so called little parts, with which they form synaps synaptic or synapsis like connections with sensory afferent fibers, primarily the vagus, vagal afferents. Um, and what makes it so intriguing. Um, a recent study um, by Elaine Chow at, at, at the time at Caltech demonstrated that microbes play a significant role in, in activating or regulating the rate limiting enzyme um, for um, serotonin synthesis, TPH, um, and that there is a loop between these spore forming clostridialis, short chain fatty acids, and secondary bile acids, that these metabolites that they produce. Um, um, to stimulate TPH and the, um, through this connection, direct connection, through the vagus nerve into emotional regulation of autonom central autonomic control centers, uh, we have this, this direct line of communication uh, from the bottom up. Um, um, dietary tryptophan from these food items um, is, a, um, is, is a substance that stimulates the, the clostridialis to um, increase the serotonin production, so the more um, of these um, you know, cheese or chocolate or nuts that we consume, the more the, the microbes will stimulate uh, the, the, the synthesis of, of serotonin. Um, what role this has, I mean obviously serotonin plays a big role in many um, basic homeostatic functions from sleep, pain, sensitivity, um, appetite, and, and, and mood. We don't know what this, what role this loop really plays in, in humans. Obviously, there must be some tonic effect. Um, uh, it's possible also that there are sex-related differences. Um, for example, the greater vulnerability of, of, of women for disorders um, of anxiety or, or depression may have something to do 
and it is related to this this bottom up loop that involves the microbes. I also want to emphasize um, there's also a top down regulation. So these cells also receive signals from the autonomic nervous system and which can stimulate the release of serotonin into the lumen of the gut. And we know that um, they have receptors for serotonin. Obviously, there's a lot of different, uh, more than 20 receptor subtypes. But microbes can respond to intraluminal um, serotonin and change their gene expression pattern and, and behavior. So it's, a, it's really a circular loop of communication and uh, regulation. No, it's not the laser point yet. Oh. Okay, so through the very elegant basic science work, the serotonin signaling with microbes that can work out for in greater detail. But we also know um, that um, other cells, the enteroendocrine cells, the whole family of cells that contain these neuropeptides, that I've had a long standing interest going back to this joint article with, with, with Pierre. Um, that contain that these substances, um, glucagon like peptide um, or PYY, um, which play a major role in, in satiety. So we've known for a long time um, that, that these cells, when um, nutrients, liquid protein, and fat reach the small intestine, these substances are being released, uh, released activate the vagus nerve, um, and produce a sensation of satiety. But well, we didn't know it at the time that the microbes play a role in this as well through um, this, what has been studied, short-chain fatty acids, the short-chain fatty acid receptors on the luminal side of these enteroendocrine cells, um, which, can, which regulate the release of these substances. So not only do the microbes play a big role in these vital functions related to serotonin, but also a major role in the regulation of appetite and, and, and satiety. So these are kind of isolated components of this communication. If, if you look at what has emerged in the meantime, um, is, is a very complex um, um, system of bidirectional communications between um, the, the nervous system, the immune, the, the nervous system, the immune system, and um, various cells in the gut and the microbes. And I'll just highlight a few parts of that. One is um, we now consider these multiple cells that are living inside the gut, the immune cells, the, the neurons from the entire nervous system, um, um, the endocrine cells, glial cells. Um, it's been referred to as the gut connectome because all of them are communicating with each other. Uh, and I think the best way to understand their response to a perturbation is to look at this really as a system. Um, we also referred to the brain as a, um, a, a connectome where multiple um, networks and circuits are interacting with, it, with each other. So we have um, both communication from the microbes directly to the brain, modifying the brain, um, but the brain can talk back to the microbes and change them. Um, and we have the same situation with the, the gut connectome um, and with the microbes um, providing input to the system as well. So this is some of the molecules that have been identified in these communications. And, and for me personally, you know, the best way I will come back to this when we talk about the disease models is um, to this in terms of a systems biological concept where perturbations can occur at different uh, locations of the system um, and, and then reverberate throughout the system. So a perturbation at the microbe level will probably always um, affect a certain degree the central nervous system, either directly or indirectly, uh, and the same thing in terms of the gut, and particularly any perturbation at the brain level in terms of stress or chronic changes in the emotional state um, certainly will have an effect on microbial behavior uh, as well as on, on the uh, environment within the gut. So we got interested in this in this topic after really just studying um, 
the communication between the brain and the gut by itself, long before the, the microbes really became a topic of, of interest. Um, so we got into this field when we, um, we embarked on a study, this was a few years after the first mouse studies had come out, and so we were interested if there's any way that we can um, reproduce any of the mouse findings in the human model. Obviously, more difficult because you can't do all the things you can do in a, in a, in a mouse model. So we hypothesized that if you perturb the, the, the gut microbiome, either in their composition and or their function, um, by the daily intake of a probiotic cocktail, five different probiotic organisms in that, in, in that mix, um, that it would in, uh, interact with the various cells inside the gut and ultimately generate an output uh, into the brain um, and we would be able to you know, uh, apply brain imaging techniques and questionnaires uh, <clears throat> and subjective assessments, we would be able to detect that effect. So it was only a proof of concept study can be by perturbing the, the, the gut microbiome connectome can be changed basically brain um, activity in a detectable manner. Um, so we used a, a standard um, emotional recognition task where the individuals have to match which uh, the two emotions match the, the one on the top. We used uh, negative valence emotions which may have been important for the, for the outcome. Um, we, as expected, um, found a, a network of brain regions that uh, <clears throat> was engaged by the task and that differed between three conditions that we did. Um, the, the probiotic, probiotic intervention with the, the actual probiotic mix, a non-fermented milk product, and a, um, a no treatment condition. Um, and so what we found, make a long story short, that um, there were differences um, in the connectivity of, this, of these networks with um, the, the subjects, these healthy subjects that received the probiotic mix, uh, showed a decrease in the connectivity um, whereas the other two groups either showed no change or the opposite action and an increase in connectivity. Because we had decided to pick young, healthy women without any evidence for um, psychological symptoms or pain symptoms, we cannot say if that intervention uh, would, have any, would have had any effect on, uh, for example, anxiety or mood or, uh, or, 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 or pain sensitivity. Um, it wasn't designed for that, and also this task is really not an emotion-inducing task, but it's an emotion recognition task. Uh, so, unfortunately, believe it or not, there's not been a follow-up study. Um, um, we've not been able to get the funding for that um, with a with a probiotic, with an antibiotic. Still have several grants pending on this, but there's not been a follow-up study, even though a growing number of animal studies would support this concept that if you um, perturb the, 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 the gut microbial function, that you would see changes in, in, in behavior, emotional -like behavior, or um, pain and -like social behavior. I should also say this intervention did not change the composition, at, at least as determined by the 16S um, RNA sequencing, um, but it did change some of the metabolites that, um, that were generated. At the time, we did not do metabolomics, um, but a study done by Jeff Gordon with exactly the same intervention without looking at the brain showed that uh, several um, uh, several uh, metabolites were altered by this intervention. So we think that, um, just one hypothesis, that um, metabolites were released that either through the systemic circulation or more likely through acting on the vagus nerve uh, led to this change in, in, in brain. Uh, responses. <clears throat> um, in a, in a follow-up study, um, um, my colleague Kirsten Tillich um, also looked at a healthy control uh, data set and um, like all the data that we're going to be showing you today are uh, cross-sectional association studies. I can't really talk about causation, unfortunately. These, these studies are ongoing. Um, but she identified, uh, looking at, the, uh, again, using 16S analysis, um, identified two 
genus based clusters, one with greater bacteroides abundance at the majority, and one with greater Crevitella abundance. Um, and she could demonstrate that um, light and gray matter um, parameters um, obtained with um, structural MRI and diffusion tensor imaging um, were able to discriminate these, um, these, these two microbial clusters with a very high, um, so look at the, the, um, the, the white matter parameters uh, with, with a high um, uh, accuracy, so almost 90% um, prediction, um, just looking at the brain parameters to which cluster these, these individuals would belong to. And she also looked at um, a different um, imaging task, maybe looking at emotionally charged images um, that uh, you know induce uh, an emotional response, so different from the test I showed you earlier. Um, and she found that this Kerbotella uh, cluster, this group, showed less hippocampal activity when viewing these negative, negative imbalance images, um, and uh, also found difference in emotional, attentional, and sensory processing brain networks. Small study, uh, consider this really a more a pilot visibility study, cross-sectional, so we can talk about causality. Um, but there is a, a, I'll show another example of this, there's a growing um, body of evidence from our own studies and others um, that there's some association between the brain architecture or brain function with the composition and function of, of the microbes. If that correlation is shaped early in life, we will have examples for that, or um, if this is something that can still develop um, in, in, in the adult, um, we will need to be determined. <coughs> So using another metaphor, as I first talked about this the systems biological concept, another metaphor are these neural networks. I personally do not understand a lot about neural networks other than um, that they can be trained, um, and once they're trained, that the output function is um, fairly uh, stable um, and, and most appropriate to the initial training situation. Um, and if you look at this in, from this review article from Elaine uh, Chow, where we have the, the, the various gut microbes, the epithelial layer that separates the gut-based immune system. And keep in mind, the gut has the biggest portion of our immune system, bigger than the spleen, bigger than the, than the bone marrow. Um, um, and then these immune cells basically signaling to the brain with one of these communication channels. Um, and I, I think a lot of data that we that have to generate up to date indicate that this this training of this of this neural network happens early on in life, uh, starting during pregnancy, so growing body evidence for that, um, that influences on the, the mother, both in terms of diet and stress have an influence um, on ultimately the function of this um, gut microbiome brain system. Um, but then also the first three years of life were um, both the microbial community is being established until it's fairly stable and stays fairly stable for the rest of life, but also where brain circuits and synapses are um, changing rapidly, uh, that during this time period this network is programmed um, and pretty much stays stable um, based on these early life experiences, early life, uh, pregnancy, and the first uh, three years of life um, can be considered. So there's many influences that we know um, that occur um, on the infant, as I said, both in utero, um, but also uh, motor delivery, um, the, the early uh, nutrition that the infants receive, exposure to antibiotics, um, and um, also other exposures, chemical exposures from the environment. So this is clearly, um, I, I would say, the, 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 the most important aspect of um, how the, the communication of our brain gut microbiome system is, is um, set up and will stay with us for the rest of our lives. There's so many studies that have shown um, um, an effect of, and, and, and many of them are done in these germ-free or notobiotic um, mouse models, which are not very um, um, natural and 
simply indicate that uh, there is an influence of microbes on several developmental processes in terms of uh, brain barrier neurogenesis, microglia function, myelination, um, and neuron survival. So there's no question that all these influences really might um, have a major impact on, on the brain. So rather than um, focusing on, um, on, on, on the adult situation of most of the studies and most of the, um, the implications that people make about clinical relevance of regular microbiome interactions, I personally think most of the important action happens uh, early on. So what happens during the adult life once the system is set up? Um, it's pretty much a, a, a process of modulation of the underlying program circuit. The brain stress and emotion can clearly uh, change temporarily uh, the, the, the composition, the function of the, of the gut microbes. Diet, a major effect, obviously, um, this is kind of this is leading to a whole uh, renaissance of the field of, 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 uh, of nutrition, which up to now has not been really a, a, a hardcore science, but I think the microbiome field is, is uh, producing a change in that. Um, in, in, in the study of interactions of food with microbes and, and effects uh, to distal organs. And um, very important, the exposure to chemicals, xenobiotics, um, and uh, particularly antibiotics. There is a phenomenal amount of exposure, even of infants, to, um, to antibiotics, often starting like, with all the uh, prematurely born babies in the ICU. The mother is often given antibiotics before delivery to prevent postpartum infections. Um, and I think there's a sort of a, an amazing number of some five doses of antibiotics given to, um, to infants before the age of uh, four. So it's, it's, this is a major effect, and given at a time of development of the system. And another thing that I think is really important to keep in mind um, if you sort of try to, to connect these, these uh, events that I you know, briefly touched upon um, to human disorders, um, so they have a different role on different types of disorders. So developmental disorders, which we think many of the psychiatric, uh, many disorders that involve the brain, um, started early on um, and uh, early on in life, and were, for example, the um, these adverse early life events have shown to be major risk factors. So, irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety, depression, uh, ingested behavior, food addiction, autism spectrum disorders. Um, clearly, the, the major um, impact, as I said, already happens during the programming of the network. Metabolic disorders, um, we're experiencing an epidemic in those disorders obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus, mellitus, and metabolic syndrome quite different, so even if somebody does not have any of these early perturbations or uh, uh, compromised programming, a long-standing intake of unhealthy food, particularly the, as it comes with the North, in form of the North American diet with high fat and high sugar, um, clearly will act on the system and shift, and shift it away from its normal um, uh, function. And then finally, neurodegenerative disorders, they manifest um, in, uh, in older age, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's time, where microbes have been implicated. Um, and it's kind of interesting, every time the microbes are not being implicated, diet is being implicated. There are many uh, large-scale, multi-center NIH trials going on with diet and any of these diseases. So in these two groups of disorders, Diet clearly plays a major role, um, whereas in these, in these developmental disorders, it's, it's a different process of this compromised early uh, programming. So, just a quick take a message from this so once, and I've said this a couple of times once, program in early life, the microbiota composition appears to be fairly stable, even though brain, dietary, and xenobiotic influences can modulate structure and function microbiome throughout life. For the majority of developmental disorders, the influence of gut microbial alterations are greatest and most enduring during the early programming period. 
So staying influences on the brain and chronic as severe stress or emotional traits or diet, during adult life can likely to contribute to chronic degenerative and inflammatory brain changes. Um, and um, short-term modulation of brain gut microbiome interactions in adult humans are unlikely to have significant influences on behavior. And th that's important when you look at the mouse experiments, so short um, period of stress or period of uh, ultra dietary intake does have these influences on behavior uh, and on emotional behaviors. Um, in humans, when you think about it, um, you're not going to feel totally different um, um, if, you, if you, for a few days, change your, your dietary habit. Most people go on, an, on antibiotics, even for courses that may last four to six weeks, do not change their mood or their affect. Um, so we, we also, like before and after a meal, we, we don't change our the level of anxiety or depression. So I think it's very important that what we see in, 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 the, in, in the mouse models is something it proves the concept that there's this interaction, but the implications for human behavior um, on the short term, I think, is very, is very limited. It wouldn't be adaptive. So every time you have a, a perturbation that you feel different. Or, um. So I'm sure a couple of, um, I don't know how I'm dealing with the time. Um, well, so, I mean, it's close to the 4 o'clock stop time, but we started a half an hour late, so uh, we have the room. I vote we just keep going, and if one of you, if you have to go, we of course understand, so that's my vote. Okay. So, yeah, so one thing is personal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, um, disorders of brain-gut interactions or so -called functional child disorders with IBS, or your person you know what I mean? Uh, disorders in this category has been a long-term clinical and research interest uh, of the biology. And um, even though you may read that this is a disorder of graphosis, uh, meaning ultra microbial composition, it, it, the, the, the story is not so simple. Um, it's about 20 different publications now in small samples. You can't really generalize it. Most of them show something different. I would say the best thing is playing ignore the great majority of these studies right now and uh, wait for larger studies to come out. What is apparent now, um, and so you can, from Jeffries, you can see, based on just the microbial composition, there seem to be subtypes of, of patients that do not differ in their symptoms. So it makes kind of question if they can have the same symptoms with different microbial composition or metabolites. Would the microbes really play a causal role, or is it just is it a top-down change? If you have one of these conditions and you feel you're more stress-prone, then you modulate your composition. Um, this one example where people found a, um, a, a subgroup of, um, of patients that have an indistinguishable gut microbial composition from healthy controls, and one or two subgroups um, um, that that are uh, different based on these principal component analyses. We found the same thing. You can you can see on, on the top um, the, the the blue dots are um, health controls. The, the green dots are a subgroup of IBS patients that um, were indistinguishable in their gut microbial composition from, um, from from the healthy controls. So we call them the healthy control. Uh, IBS group, and then one group that is clearly different, quite similar to what the Jeffrey study found. Again, we did not find um, correlation with clinical parameters, neither bowel habits nor um, pain predominance. Um, but we did find a, 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 a difference in the history of early adverse life events. Um, so, if you remember early the programming phase, so. Patients that fell into this abnormal group had a higher um, prevalence of um, these early adverse life events, self-reported. Um, several factors, micro um, you know, microbial factors that contributed to this subclassification um, are listed here. It's again a small study, um, several limitations, 16S sequencing, not, no longer the state-of-the-art. Uh, 
um, assessment of uh, gut microbial architecture. Um, but what we did find, and that was really kind of our main interest here, um, that there was a correlation of this um, gut microbial composition with, with brain structure. Um, so the, I guess one group, that this group here, had smaller volumes in frontal and insular regions and larger volumes in sensory motor network regions, um, which is consistent with a lot of our previous studies where we found that patients with IBS as a, as a general group have these alterations, these greater volumes, um, differences in, um, um, in, in DTI parameters and fiber tract um, density um, in, the, in the sensory motor system, consistent with the fact that they not only are more sensitive to intestinal sensations and symptoms, but also to many other sensory stimuli. So one step that people in, in the human investigation of uh, brain gut microbiome interactions have been using is this reverse transplantation. So you take well-cared, well-phenotyped uh, IBS patients, take the stool and put them into antibiotic mice, humanized mice, um, and then look at the behavior of, of, of these mice. Um, and with the group at, at McMaster, um, they, they did this study, they found that the, the behavior of the, the mice was altered. They didn't really show signs of IBS, I think this people tied up with, but they did show um, behavioral changes consistent with increased anxiety like behavior. And that was um, more pronounced from when they received stool from subjects that had increased rates of, uh, of anxiety. So clearly, something is in the fecal material. Of, of these patients that um, has an effect on the, on the uh, on the brain. Now, what what this could be um, in, a, in a in a different study um, when mice was were put under chronic variable stress paradigm for I think four or six weeks, um, it was found, and this is kind of consistent with with. Um, with many studies of, of chronic stress, that the abundance of lactobacilli um, decreases in the stress has been shown in monkeys, um, in mice, and also in, in, in humans. And the reason this is um, of interest because in this model, these animals develop a depression-like behavior, the, this bear behavior. If you hold them up in their tail, uh, they stop fighting against that. Um, so the lower the lactobacillus concentration, the um, the list of this escape behavior, so it's considered a depression-like trait. But the reason I'm, I'm showing this is mainly because um, so lactobacillus plays an important role in the production of hydrogen peroxide, which activates, uh, which which inhibits this enzyme IDOL, um, which plays a major role in the metabolism of tryptophan to pandurinine. Um, so normally. Um, the, the main focus has always been on the production of serotonin from tryptophan, but the canurinine pathway has been implicated in depression, the, the, the increased activation, uh, but also in, in IBS. So the decrease in, in lactobacilli, decrease of this inhibition will lead to an increased level of, of, of canurinine. And um, so we, we have uh, looked at this, we found that in uh, in, in our patient population, um, we found um, an increase in, 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 in canurinine levels um, in correlation with a particular group of, of microorganisms. And I'd like to focus on this particular graph, which is kind of intriguing, because it still needs to be confirmed in a, in a validation study. Here's this um, um, metabolism shown again. And tryptophan to canurinine um, related to the, the lactobacilli. So we found when we looked at the canurinine levels, or plasma levels in our patients, um, and correlated them with um, imaging parameters obtained with diffusion tense imaging with DTI, um, that they correlated with very distinct changes in a, um, in a brainstem region close to the, the serotonin containing nuclei, the rapid. Russell Raffinucli and um, 
can't really differentiate from these um, initial studies with the 3T um, um, magnet if this also includes the locus aureus and the norepinephrine training sites. But these changes um, in, um, in this median fractional uh, uh, and, and isotropy and apparent diffusion coefficient are most consistent with uh, uh, chronic inflammatory or degenerative changes in this brain region. So canurinine, the substance that is increased in the context of mouse models with chronic stress, um, is elevated in, in our patient population, um, show this correlation with a very vital region in, in brain gut uh, communication that uh, many previous studies have implicated in dysregulation both of uh, GI activity but also um, visceral sensitivity. So the model that we have come up with um, it sort of that in, incorporates all the findings, um, both the, the top down, so stress, canurinine, um, metabolism, change in abundance of microbes, but also the, the bottom up that we can modulate brain circuits with um, perturbation of the microbiome by uh, probiotic. Um, I, uh, so we've come up with this model that um, in individuals that have a genetic predisposition, so most people with their bowel syndrome have, have a family history, I have this um, evidence for that, many studies have shown that, um, together with epigenetic factors like the early life stress, um, again an extensive literature that supports this. Um, finally that in an individual like that, a um, trauma or chronic stress, you know, from studies up to 60% of patients will first report their IBS symptoms or report an exacerbation, um, that in such an individual this will lead to an increased engagement of the, the autonomic nervous system, stress response, change the, um, the, the, the gut connectome, and produces several changes, like changes in the composition, the microbes, um, increased permeability, so the, the term leakiness, this has sort of become popular for that, uh, so stress plays a major role in that. Um, and also in uh, immune activation, so a, a change in the, in the behavior of that entire system, which then leads to a generation of neuroactive um, microbial metabolites. Um, in some situations, probably depending on the chronicity, in the generation of immune um, um, uh, mediators, um, LPS or uh, low, low, dose, low grade, uh, low concentrations of cytokines. So this has been referred to as um, metabolic uh, toxemia, so a low-grade inflammation without um, um, actually infectious agent. And then that these, these mediators feed back to the brain. Um, and so we have seen that, that it can actually be associated with structural and functional brain changes. And this we can only hypothesize if one of these, so IBS is a complex syndrome that has anxiety, depression, um, um, uh, alteration in sensitivity, autonomic creativity, that one of these dimensions may be, may be modulated by these microbial mediators. So that also means that the this, this system can be perturbed in a vulnerable individual, either, you know, that gastroenteric infections, for example, uh, it's an entity called post-infectious um, IBS that can start here, starting with the dysbiosis and um, you know, get, getting, the, getting the entire system perturbed, or you can start with, with an major stressor. I think I'm going to skip over the next time there's a lot of slides I'm going to skip over, but I think it's pretty um, Yeah, so let me just say a, a few things. I'm just going to pick a few of these um, slides that sort of are, are, are addressing interesting points. So this book has just come out from sort of the pioneers, and I'm, I'm sure um, uh, John Cryan may have spoken here at the symposium. Um, so this group in, in Cork University in, in, in Ireland has really done the pioneering studies, the mouse studies. Um, and they, so John Cryan has probably written some 200 review articles since then. 
um, all of which sort of implicate that what they found in, in the animals all applies to, to human conditions, psychiatric conditions. We've just come out with this book for the lay public, Psychonautic Revolution, that uh, with the um, implication that in the future we'll be able to treat psychiatric diseases and psychological symptoms with probiotics. Um, so I personally have to say, even though this would be a great advance in the field, so far we don't really have the evidence in humans that that is indeed the case. Um, and I'll, I'll show you one uh, a diagram why I, I think this is it's going to be very difficult to prove it, at least with the existing probiotics. Um, a lot of people are working on um, either isolating particular microorganisms in the gut that may be deficient, for example, in patients with depression, and substitute and basically um, counteract from this deficiency by externally giving um, these microbes, or by genetic engineering of certain microbes that they produce, increase their production, for example, of GABA um, and in, in inhibitor neurotransmitter that some of these microbes have the genes for, um, but don't express in large amounts after infancy. Um, so the final word of this is not out yet, but I think what we can say today that currently existing commercially available probiotics um, almost certainly have no major effect beyond placebo um, in terms of psychobiotic effects. So to, to, to summarize this, um, we didn't have the time to, to show you similar kind of progress as I showed you for the IBS um, the disorder has happened in, uh, in patients with, with depression. Same kind of experimental paradigms, studying phenotyping large samples of patients, um, then taking, doing a reverse transplant, fecal transplant into mice. The, the mice show some change in the emotional behavior. Uh, this is now being reproduced by four different groups in the world. So clearly indicating there's something in the fecal material that, at least in mice, uh, changes the um, circuits in the brain that are involved in, um, um, in, in, in emotional regulation. And similar in obesity, um, similar situation that, um, that metabolites in the stool seem to be uh, affecting, uh, in, in obese patients, seem to be affecting ingested behaviors. Um, so this field is moving on different fronts and some I think there's, the progress is faster than others. Um, in addition to these three, depression, obesity, and um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, clearly some intriguing um, possibilities now in, um, in, in patients with Parkinson's disease, or um, we do know that, it, that this disease starts in the gut, um, and that it migrates up through the vagus nerve in a large portion of patients and then alters, gradually alters brain function. Why it starts in the gut and why it starts with the enteric nervous system changes, what role microbes play in this process, I think it's a very exciting uh, question. And probably will, there's a lot of people working in this space right now. So I think what we can say today, um, that um, so the, the general model, and I mentioned this in, in, in this IBS model as well, that. Uh, in a pool of healthy people with genetic susceptibility to one or more polygenic disorders, <clears throat> that uh, non-specific environmental factors, chronic infections, um, antibiotics, chemicals, particularly diet, um, can lead to these um, to these dysbiotic states, either in the composition and or the production of metabolites. Um, then, and then only uh, only in the people that have the vulnerabilities will this can this lead to a, an actual disease state, so a small fraction of the general population. Um, and then what, we, what the field is currently doing is then take these, these, altered, um, these altered microbial community into an autobiotic mice and um, aiming to prove causality in this, um, uh, in this, in, in this process. Um, but this will clearly explain, so the microbes are not the cause of any of these diseases. They are a trigger in vulnerable people, uh, genetically vulnerable people, um, that, um, 
then we get an auto input from from the from the guard microbial um, um, system. So I've been and 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 I continue to be kind of critical about these the the current trend to to, um, to take animal data and then say that they're uh, easily translatable to humans. So just a few uh, reasons why that this approach has not really worked that well up to now. So, um, uh, with, for example, with, with a, a, a probiotic intervention um, that does work in animals, um, but has not really been shown to be very effective in, in human situation, maybe the wrong targets, the wrong probiotic agents, in, incorrect disease mechanisms, product is potent, um, in terms of IBS, like most other polychain diseases, heterogeneous conditions, only a subset of patients with dysbiosis may respond. Um, age of patients, so it may be more effective in infants, first three years of life than in, in adults. And then, um, most importantly, the, the, the different com degree of complexity of the human brain with the, with the mouse brain. So, I, I mean, I always like to, to show this, not only is the size, the mouse and the human brain very, very different, but also you can see that the, some of the, the vital portions, like the prefrontal cortex in the mouse is, is very underdeveloped. Um, and it's kind of like comparing an HP calculator from the 70s with the um, IBM Watson and, and trying to predict that um, the mechanisms that underlie the, the, the hand calculator would explain the complex functions of, um, of, of our modern supercomputers. Almost at the end now, so to summarize. So results from broaden studies clearly demonstrate the role of gut microbiome in altering, these, um, in, in alter, altering bidirectional brain gut microbiome interactions and behavior. And some of these associations have been demonstrated in humans. This fecal microbial transplantation from human brain disease population to germ free mice recapitulates some, but not all, of the human phenotypes. And this concept that, the, that you can't really extrapolate from the outputs of the mouse brain to the human brain, particularly in terms of um, complex disorders like depression and anxiety, um, which may be influenced to a large degree by cognitive factors and are not, as there are in the mouse, a direct translation of uh, emotional brain circuits. Um, and so I, I, I think the, what the field needs the most, and everybody realizes that, if you write a grant nowadays, you have to Build in the causality, otherwise the associated. I think the, the 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 era of association studies is pretty much over because that has not really led to any sort of major breakthroughs. Um, so I, I think in the next five years we'll see a lot of the results of the ongoing studies about the causality, longitudinal studies with interventions in large data sets, um, and the application of. Um, of, of, of advanced bioinformatics approaches to to that system that I tried to convince you the brain that microbiome assets represents. So is is medicine poised for a fundamental uh, transformation because of the, 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 the microbiome science? I would say that my my answer to this is a a careful yes, um, but there's a lot of points that we're missing to really. Um, um, identify which areas of, of human disorders this really plays a, a, a causative role and is not a, a secondary consequence of uh, changes that the brain causes at the, on, on, on the gut level. So these are the people from our group that have contributed to this. And then I can help say in case you haven't, um, you haven't heard about that book, so text the, the um, Mind cut to this number, and um, you'll get a newsletter, and it will be informed on a regular basis on um, hot topics in this in this field. Thank you very much. Uh, the, 
Yeah, so the, the you know, I, I just came back from a probiotic uh, reading, and I think the consensus is in large meta-analysis. I mean, there's now almost more meta-analysis of small studies than original studies. But it, it does appear that, uh, that, that many probiotics that seem to be simply have a beneficial effect, which is not very big, between 5 and 10 percent above placebo. Um, and in some patients that may, in some of these studies it was higher, and the others was, it was lower. Um, like in other areas, they may be more beneficial in some subsets of patients, for example, in the in the group that has an animal uh, microbiome composition at baseline. In this case, a particular probiotic may actually be more effective than 5 to 10%. Um, but if you, if you give it to everybody, uh, it's, so they're not miracle interventions. They're, they're not the miracle drugs that are being sold for. If you go on the internet, there's obviously hundreds of, um, of distributors that, that promise, you know, they will change everything. And, that the combination that this particular company has is better than anybody else because it's billions of, of, of units and 15 different um, microbes. I mean, none of these things are actually uh, have been validated um, or, or, or evidence-based. So I, I, I think that's a, the classic thing for induction of a placebo. You say there's 15 of the, the best selected microbes with the highest concentration that also will will have a greater effect as if you take one probiotic, um, you know, mixed into a yogurt. But, um, but again, I, I think at this point, um, all these people that offer, all, all these companies that offer these probiotics, um, they do not want to go through clinical trials, as you would have to do for, for you know, any medication. And the companies that have well-selling products, like you know, probiotic rich yogurts like Activia, I mean, they don't want to do a clinical trial that's going to cost them millions and at the end it will have a negative effect. So, they would. so I, I don't think we'll get the definitive answer. Nobody so far has stepped up and said, we're going to do the definitive trial on 500 you know, patients and, and see which subset responds to the, to the probiotic. But they claim like the same pill. Some say they have 10 million, some say 20 million. Some say 15 million. I even get a one say 19 billion yeah, yeah. in the, the pill. Yeah, but we don't even know if, if those numbers are, are relevant or if it's, uh, you know, if, if it's a, the, 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 the type of strain. To so some people that do the animal studies, um, at the group in, 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 in Cork and at, at McMaster University, so they say that that, that strain of a, of, a, of, a, of a probiotic has been selected out of hundreds of strains, and only that strain has this effect on the on the, uh, on, the uh, on the brain. I personally don't believe that because how would you screen hundreds of, of probiotic organisms to find out which one has you know, has that effect? So it's um, this is a dark side of this field. I have to say, you know, I and mean, if you're a scientist, you're horrified. You know, what's being recommended? Um, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm certainly, I've been approached after writing a book by a lot of companies to endorse them, could have made a lot of money doing that, but I, I just could not do that. I mean, I just find it's unethical at this point to become a spokesperson for any existing probiotic. This is a more general question. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you, you spoke about the second brain, you made a kind of an evolutionary argument for the neurology of the gut being, in fact, the first brain. And then in the rest of the talk, you spoke exclusively about the relationship between the microbiome and the brain. What happened to the brain and the gut? Yeah, there's quite a few studies that have shown, for example, short-chain fatty acids acting on enteric neurons. Um, um, so my, my feeling is, um, so we, we have not specialized in that, in that area, but I would um, expect from what I showed you earlier um, that so certainly in the hydra the main interaction was with regulating peristalsis and um, that that it, this is still to a significant degree the case that, um, and and that ultimately may turn out to be the more important one you know it's it's not as sexy as saying that it changes your mind and um, but there are people working on this and. 
Um, I've seen evidence that green plants were, there's, there's certainly significant effects established by electrophysiology of enteric neurons in vitro, um, and also just on, on the regulation of the parasitic reflex. So I, I think the microbes, they have a lot to do with, with how our gut functions normally. Right? Totally um, independent of the way they do to the, to, to the brain. No, I, I, I totally agree. You mentioned in your talk that a lot of this gets set in early years of life. Yeah, and so the question, the question then is, what triggers the disease development? Is, is there something else that happens uh, that causes the disease to? Does it appear in everybody or? Okay, so you know what I showed on the slides. So there's clearly this the genetic vulnerability that kind of sets in some ways the, how, how the, the brain, the autonomic nervous system, and the gut interact. Then the perturbation that, that happened early on in life, I showed you this thing. There's more factors that influence. Um, um, I'll just give you one example. For example, it, it, it's been a really interesting study by, um, by, by, by Tracy Bale uh, last year where they showed that stress of a pregnant mother changes the vaginal microbiome, and when the, the, the mouse pups are born, they go through a different exposure in the, in the birth canal, and that has an influence on the early brain development of, um, you know, of, these, of, of these pups. So a lot of disease influences that then predispose you, or you know, uh, in a genetic individual, genetic predisposed individual, happen during that early life period. And then what I, what I was saying later, once this is established, you may never get any disease at all. I mean, you, may, you may just have a slightly altered um, communication. You may be somebody, you know, I hear this from many patients, a very common comment, I've always had a sensitive gut, which, which means that, you know, they're more sensitive to, uh, to different foods, to new medications. So that could be something that said early on, that, that greater sensitivity. Um, but then later in life, you know, it's, it's, it's the diets we're on, um, and, um, and, and all the other chemicals from, you know, the next wide open field from, from glyphosate, um, um, pesticides, you know, like, like all these things, I and mean, what do they do to the, to the gut microbiome? And if you're chronically exposed to it, even if there's nothing wrong in the beginning, in the early, the early program, but if you're chronically exposed to, to those agents, you know, to what degree does that affect your, your microbiome brain communication? Yeah, and again, that goes into this gray zone, you know, there's no, there, there, there's no really evidence-based information that would, would say, like, you know, you'd have a gut feeling if you take a, a, a consortium, I mean, this is kind of, I think a general idea, if you want to influence the gut, you want to work with a consortium of, of microbes, that's the approach that's been taken, you know, in this common, in, in, in this well-known disease, um, um, C. difficile colitis, or, you know, after an antibiotic, some people develop, they, they basically knock out their normal uh, gut microbiome. And we know that fecal transplantation is the ultimate um, uh, combination microbe treatment. But, you know, companies like Ceres, I mean, they have tried to isolate a consortium of microbes, a, a, a limited number, five or ten microbes, that would do have the same effect. So you can almost say, I mean, that we're going to get an answer to this question from a lot of efforts on this um, the C. difficile colitis, you know, like getting away from the fecal microbial transplant to something that is a defined population of, of, of microbes. I think once people have, so so far it's not, it's not worked, so it's, 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 this promising approach by a series with something like that has not turned out uh, um, positive, does in animals but not in humans. Um, but, but I think once we know that, that's the first step, then you can say, okay, for, 
certain diseases you need a combination of different kinds of, of probiotics that, that have a beneficial effect. And what about the spore forming bacteria versus the generic non spore forming bacteria? Like, how, how do they compare? Either for the gut itself or like a gut brain. Because they're not commensal to the body, right? Like the spore forming bacteria, but they are in products now. So how, how do those work? I, can, I really can't give you an answer to that question. But it's, you know. Well, most of the gut bugs are spore forming bacteria. So this, this, this close to the others, you know, that, um, that Elaine Chow has, has shown play an important role in the serotonin synthesis. So that's, for example, an, an, an interesting question. I mean, could you reproduce that effect? So, um, if somebody's deficient in, in, in these spore forming close to the others, and therefore it has a, um, an inefficient system to produce uh, serotonin, if you could identify that group and then you know give a probiotic that does that, um, so I mean. I think we're just too far away from that. You know, in, in 10 years from now, this field will look very different. Probably a lot of the things that we're currently discussing as potential treatments will fall by the wayside because they're not working. But I, I think there will be there will be new avenues for treating some some chronic diseases. Right now, I mean, this is what I would always say. So right now, the most effective way is probably dietary. Um, you know, the, the high plant-based um, or you know, predominantly plant-based diet, which we know is the best for the microbes. It will increase the abundance and diversity. Um, and not by coincidence, there's many studies now in even psychiatry, in depression, in Alzheimer's, um, in Parkinson's with, with these Mediterranean type or mind diets. Um, so I think that's kind of the current approach that's probably the most effective and straightforward before you can come up with individual consortia of microbes that you can uh, influence something in a more than a pharmacological sense. Last question, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, any thoughts on prebiotics? Yeah, so prebiotics that falls really in this in this in this area of food as well. You know, food is a, is a prebiotic fiber. Um, yeah, if if I would recommend something, I would probably say the prebiotic approach is probably the, the more plausible at the moment. Um, but then, you know, there was been a recent study with a group in, in, in Michigan um, that, that showed if, if they put um, mice on a, on a fiber-free diet um, and then substitute a, a prebiotic to these mice, they would not recover to the same level as the ones that, that had the, the, the regular high-fiber diet. So, I would always say diet is the number one thing. Um, minimization of antibiotics um, is a second one. Um, and then emotional factors. I mean, clearly, you know, stress, so we know that for sure, stress does affect the, the microbial composition, the, the whole gut connectome function, the permeability. So these are the, the three areas, I think, that um, some people would include exercise. Um, some studies now that, that exercise does affect the, the microbial composition. To what degree that is beneficial, we don't really know. I mean, th this could be one of the mechanisms why it's good for your brain, the exercise, but speculation. Um, you, you mentioned in passing that, that, that Parkinsonism is first manifesting in that. What is the phenotype that you're yeah, okay, so that's been a really, that's been a really exciting um, development. Um, and there's a lot of activity with startups and even big pharma analysis. So what turned out in, in the last 10 years, I think studies have come out that, um, that in, in, in my enteric neurons, or the enteric nervous system, uh, that there's the, the earliest changes in, in Parkinson's patients long before they develop any CNS complications. That you see the same degenerative changes. So you see that as a, so you're seeing the generation of myotaric plexus. Yeah, you see these Lewy bodies in, in, in the myotaric neurons. And then there's there have been studies um, that, that it seems so it, it kind of pro uh, progresses in stages. So the first is the myotaric mm -hmm. neurons, which often is associated with constipation, new onset constipation. 
And th there may be a period of 20 years before these early degenerative changes, before there's actually neurological manifestations, right. which is a huge uh, opportunity, obviously, for, for, um, for therapeutic interventions. And that's where a lot of um, money is going into that research. But ultimately, it migrates up. These Lewy bodies migrate up the vagus nerve into the nucleus tractus solitarius, and from there to higher to the, the dopamine system and the, and the, and the, and the cortex. It's a very slow process. Um, you know, as I said, there are dietary intervention studies now that seem to slow the progression. And, uh, may, there may also be the possibility of early diagnosis with um, a couple of studies that have taken biopsies from patients with new onset constipation. And on these biopsies, you could see these, these degenerative changes. <coughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, that's a very exciting area. Do you think that in the future we'll be able to point to a micro, microbiome and say that is a healthy one and this is an unhealthy one, or are we going to be able to yeah, so that, yeah. it? So, so that's another really interesting question. So believe it or not, but we still don't know what a healthy microbiome is. Um, and so this question comes up in many discussions. When you talk to ecologists, they say, um, so there's different healthy ecosystems depending on or in the world, you know, it's different ecosystem uh, on the North Pole as opposed to the, the Amazon. Um, and that, that may be the case for humans as well. So in general, right now, in the absence of a good answer, uh, most people would say the degree of diversity and abundance is, like in other ecosystems, is a sort of one criteria, we would say. Um, and, you know, if, if you compare, for example, so the few remaining hunter-gatherers in, in the world, like the Hatsta in Africa and the Yanomami in, on, on, on the Orinoco River. So their diversity and abundance is about 40% higher than um, people in North America, even in infants. So this is the most interesting thing. So it's not that um, you know, their lifestyle and their diet um, this, this really starts probably with the mother, the pregnant mother, what she eats, and, and, and the influence of breast milk on the diversity. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, these, these people, um, they die at the age of 40 and 50 from, from accidents and injuries, so we don't really know if, if they came, or also like when they go, so when they've taken people from the Yanomami villages into Caracas, and they eat a Western diet, they become super obese. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, so it's so it's it's not a universally uh, guarantee for for health if you start out with this high diversity. It depends on on the context I think you're living in. And as a follow-up question, is there a different set of parameters that makes a healthy microbiome in children versus as we get older throughout life? Um, Probably it's in general the same, I would, I, I would say. So, I mean, it starts with the nutrition of the mother. I mean, it's like it's, you almost have to look at this as a continuum, you know, from, from pregnancy. Several studies now have shown that the, the quality of the mother's nutrition during pregnancy is a major influence on, for example, the risk for obesity and uh, this alteration in the gut microbiome of the infants. Um, so, and the recommendations are, you know, so in, in short of really knowing a hard answer on this, is um, the recommendations are this many plant-based diet in for the pregnant mother, and which will then, you know, through breast milk, be transmitted to the early microbiome of the infant. I don't think there's really a good specific. I mean, the one thing that you can say that infant formula is obviously a bad thing. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting because what infant formulas lack is these human milk oligosaccharides that are human breast milk, and which are really the, the, the main mechanism to establish the early microbial community in, in, in the infant. So these are large molecules that cannot be absorbed by the, by the, by the, by the baby. So they go all the way down to the microbes, and the microbes then digest them, and because um, they are unique, there are hundreds of these different molecules, 
and they're influenced by genetics and diet of the mother. So they're kind of the communication signal for the establishment of the antibody in the bio. Um, an infant form that doesn't have those. So um, until recently, industry has not been able, so Nestle, the main producer of infant formula, has not been able to synthesize these, these molecules. So all these kids that have grown up like in, in developing countries with, with infant formula most likely have a, a compromised blood microbiome because they never had that, that influence. And so, so you have to tell me however long we can go on. Yeah, well, I mean, you have a big audience still, so if you don't mind answering questions, I think it's great. <laughs> Uh, so, so it, it, it seems that um, that what's critical is the time when these cognitive uh, systems are being formed and immune systems being formed, and, 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 and uh, gut communities are also being created at the same time. Is there any data about the timing of weaning and, and, and effects? Because I'm assuming that the, you know that the, 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 that, that that transition from mother's milk to food is going to affect the timing of gut biome development. Do we, is there any, any data relating that with cognitive de development? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. So, uh, you know, Jeff Gordon from WashU, I mean, he's, he's really focused on this, um, on this early malnutrition concept, and they've done some really elegant studies. Um, you know, what, what the influence is of... Um, um, so... So, so the microbiome changes with the addition of, of, of real food. So if you do that early on, the, the, the microbiome will change faster to an adult type, uh, as, as opposed to, uh, so like the, you know, the Yanomami uh, Indians, they, they nurse their children up to three years, but they feed them at the same time with bananas, you know, and, and, and so, yeah, I can't give you a good answer on that, but, but certainly the, the, the the ratio of breastfeeding with of breast milk to to solid food is the main determinant when your microbes change from this uh, early. So the shorter the, the this developmental period, these three years can be shortened. If, so my guess would be that um, you know in, in, in Western societies, particularly uh, you know. 20, 30 years ago, where breastfeeding was not really recommended, um, that that has had a significant influence. I mean, the big question to me is always, you know, we've gone through major changes in this, like the whole infant nutrition. We don't really know if that had any major effect on cognitive um, development or uh, emotional uh, stability or it's... Um, yeah, and there's, there's many questions like that. Like, for example, I, I've been interested in, in, in Korea, you know, where there's this um, very high consumption of, of fermented foods from infancy on. Um, I, I, you know, the first time I saw this in a Mason Korean restaurant, we order one main dish and we get 30 mm -hmm. side dishes, all different fermented types of foods. And, so you would think that, that if, if this is beneficial, you know, there should be a much lower prevalence of uh, uh, brain disorders. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to figure it out because uh, there's a big stigma on psychiatric diagnosis in Korean society, so you, you can't even get these numbers. So it is, I don't know. But you were said because Korea is all crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a lot of interesting questions you know, that could be done in larger neurological studies. And it's quite possible that some, at some point when somebody does that, we'll find out, okay, yeah, it's got to be due to the microbiome. But right now, I think it's, there's a lot of guessing. In, in malnutrition, so Jeff Gordon's studies, I highly recommend you know, to look at some of his papers. That idea that early malnutrition creates kind of a memory in the, in the early, in this, um, in this neural network that I explained to you that even if these kids later get a full nutrition, neither the microbiome nor this something will be, you know, can be reversed. So there's, there's clearly early influences in terms of diet um, that can cause these lifelong changes, which is consistent with this model that I showed you.
the overfeeding and the underfeeding in the early first phase of life will have lifelong consequences on you. Yes. Thank you for the talk, by the way. It was wonderful. Even after the crazy drive, I'm sure. It was a little stressful. Um, so I appreciate your comment on being careful to extrapolate the animal data to humans and all of your points about why we have to be cautious. But I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about specifically if you think there are some mechanisms that are not going to be true in humans, or if it's just more your sort of haha gut instinct that, you know, well, human brain is very different than a rat brain, or a human brain is very different than a mouse brain, or if you're actually seeing things that you would expect to be seeing in human data, you know, that you're seeing in the animal research that are just aren't panning out, which are making you kind of have this concern. Because obviously there's, you know, great animal models of stress and immunity that are panning out in humans. Like, what is it that's making you have this kind of skepticism? Yeah, I mean, so, so in general, I mean, I feel that the that the top-down influences of stress and the autonomic nervous system on the periphery, I think, are more similar between animals, and um, and there is an extensive literature on that. Um, I, I think it's more complicated to extrapolate from the signals that this huge brain receives and what it does with it, um, and to compare the mouse and and, and the human brain. But I think the top-down all the way from early adverse life events to you know the methylation, uh, the genetic effects of early life, uh, early traumatic life events, and seem to be similar in, in, in humans and and, 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 and rodents. Um, yeah. So my, my main concern is really, the, and you know, so one of my key experiences has been in this, in this uh, having worked with with, with mouse models. So for a while. There was this expectation that these corticotropin releasing factor antagonists, the CR1 receptor antagonists, would become the miracle drug because they were able to block um, all the uh, exaggerated stress responses in every animal model from the mouse to the monkey to the. Um, and we actually did an imaging study in, in humans with one of these agents, and we could see that it attenuated the amygdala response to a you know, psychological stressor. But all the clinical trials were completely negative. I mean, I, I could not believe, I mean, nobody could believe that. So the best explanation I have is that you can sort of affect systems, um, just so some systems like the amygdala circuits, the fear circuits, are probably kind of similar still. But then in humans, you have this huge overlay of that anxiety. Human anxiety is major cognitive components, the same with depression. That can override these underlying, you know, um, more, more primitive circuits, and that, that if you did studies in infants, they're probably more similar to the mice because you don't have the, all these overlays. Um, but in the adult, I, I, I personally, yeah. So that that, that last slide with this comparison of these different computer systems, I, I think that, I mean, unless somebody produces the data to, to completely refute that. I, I, has anyone tried? Like, is there data that's failing, or is it just not done yet? Working properly? No, I think with many psychiatric and chronic pain medications, you know, the, most of them have failed. I mean, okay. This is just some very prominent chronic pain researchers and mouse models um, that have written reviews that basically you cannot develop a chronic pain treatment that works in humans just based on a mouse model. Visits. But, but then, you know, I mean, mouse models are obviously very important for, for these reverse, um, uh, you know, fecal microbial transplant. I think mean, it's the standard now. I mean, for that, it's, it's, it's really useful. Um, so, actually, kind of related question. So, I really appreciate how you're saying that it's not that the microbiome can affect the brain so quickly that every time you I mean, you would be totally maladaptive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, so, so then how do you think it would be possible to assess the influence of the microbiome on emotion? Because it's changing so much with diet and lots of other influences. So how could you get a signature of emotion that's big enough to rise above all the fluctuations that happen in your daily life? Um. Well, I, mean, I, I think one kind of approach, you know, which is happening now with the study of diet and and, 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 and nutrition, that um, I mean, two kind of approaches to try to control this. One, to bring people into um, 
clinical studies unit, um, a small number of, of subjects and really uh, enforce an identical diet. The other one is to, to send, you know, to have uh, Whole Foods, Amazon send um, packaged food for two weeks, so people are doing that as well. Um, but until now, I mean, almost none of these studies have been published. There was a control for the, the, the various diets that people want. <clears throat> and even if you do a questionnaire, you know, people say they have, they're, they're quite unreliable because um, I mean, who would remember what you ate um, last week, you know, for, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? So it's. Um, so I mean, there are there are some attempts to standardize this. Um, but they are expensive, so you bring patients into you know, clinical studies unit or sending, sending them the food. It's, um, most studies have not done that yet. Well, oh, Allison? Yeah, so um, based on what you were saying in your talk, it strikes me that children who are born and put in a NICU, neonatal ICU, are getting a major blow because major life stress, lots of chemicals, uh, they're young, their microbiome is being formed at that time. So has any work been done to understand, like, are people who are now alive, who were born in NICU when they were babies, are they, I mean, well, I think what we know is that there's a much higher risk for psychiatric disorders later in life. I don't know if it affects other diseases as well. Um, but, yeah, so that would be an interesting longitudinal study, you know, yeah. which would potentially. Yeah, but, but you would expect, so I mean, there are you know, C sections, so C section comes on top of that, so like almost all the normal stages of the shaping of a, of, of a healthy microbiome and uh, microbiome brain interaction are compromised. In, in right, state. and their brains are developing. I mean, their brains are already at high risk for seizures and all other kinds of problems. So you've got this kind of catched, you've got this accumulation of major events occurring at the same time that the brain is developing and the same time that the, 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 the lungs too, actually. So, yeah. yeah no, I think this is a really good question. I've not looked at that, but I'll, I'll probably ask a student to. to, <laughs> to I've got a student who wants to do that. Oh, you, you have that? Yes. Yeah, okay, so that would be really. I mean, the thing that I remember yeah. from years ago, <laughs> so once we were interested in studying the outcomes of um, 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 you know, infants that, that, uh, that went through a total uh, enterectomy early mm -hmm. on. Um, I don't know which condition, like an infarct of, of, of the mesentery yeah. artery, but yeah. that, that grow up without an intestine, basically. And um, so there's a there's a very high prevalence of psychiatric problems later, behavioral problems later. But that could be obviously for various reasons, you know. Right. But it's um, yeah. If if you contrast that with um, so patients with ulcerative colitis, for example, undergo total colectomy. So that's another example to emphasize my, my, my point. I've talked to a lot of them. Um, what Did anything happen after the total colectomy? Did mm -hmm. you feel differently? Did the mood change or depression? If anything, most of them say they feel a lot better because they no longer have this uncertainty yeah. of um, <laughs> you know, the colitis. Yeah. So that almost indicates to me that this shaping phase is the key. Later, you can do pretty massive um, Changes, you know, you can take out like two thirds of the microbes, and once that system is established, it, it will function, you know, normally. Um, I mean, there's a lot of these clinical things, like you know, you, so if you're a clinician and um, like when I read the animal studies, I always sort of come up with these clinical questions, and like your, your question was really excellent, and then you can see how much it matches what. You know, from these extrapolations that you can make from an animal model alone. Mm -hmm. Maybe last question. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking back to Dr. Lightson's question was I thought really excellent and how do you differentiate from the noise of emotional changes 
in humans. And I was wondering, is there a mechanism that has been identified at this point that is controlling the, the emotional regulation with the gut? And is there, are there genetic polymorphisms that we could look at to better understand that? Um, so I'm not exactly sure if I really understood what, okay. what, what, what uh, I mean, I guess you can, you can imagine that you're trying to differentiate different levels of emotional responses and you can look at that by the outcome or you can look at that by the mechanism by which the signal is being transmitted to the brain. So can we look at different variations in how the signal is being transmitted to the brain as a, a way to understand the emotional output as opposed to just looking at the I'm not sure if I can really give you a good answer on it. I guess it's like I'm thinking more like basic science. Is there something we can knock out, you know, in an animal model or can we look for a difference in But to do this in a in a in a human? Uh, in not a human? in a human we have to look for genetic you know, polymorphisms, but yeah, is there Um Yeah, I'm I'm probably not the expert to okay. be able to give you the, the answer to that, but um So you gave us a lot of answers today, right? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.